like to thank everyone for joining us today for a seminar on uh, particulate modeling in the San Joaquin Valley, the RB Contract Testing 301. My name is William Vance, and I work at the Atmospheric Processes Research Section of the California Air Resources Board, and I'm the contract manager for this work. Um, before I introduce the speaker, I need to cover a few announcements and some background to the project. Um, First, additional information about the speaker as well as slides for the presentation can be found at this link. It's www.arb.ca.gov slash research slash seminars slash Kleeman4 slash Kleeman.htm. For those of you online, speakers, for, uh, questions for the speaker can be sent to coastalrm at kellypa.ca.gov. And um, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of this presentation where these will be addressed. For those in the in-person audience, um, I need to cover the emergency protocol. In the event of a fire or, or other emergency, exits are located in the front of the room on either side. So the two front, this one. Um, so, uh, so there's one exit here, and we're required to evacuate the room immediately. Please do not use an elevator. We are to exit down the stairway and gather at the new location site across the street in Cesar Chavez Plaza, where we are to wait for further instruction. Before we begin, I'd like to give a, a general overview of the uh, area under consideration for this project. Um, the San Joaquin Valley, it's a unique topographical and meteorological um, area of California and its conditions present a challenge to regu regulatory efforts to comply with particulate matter standards. Um, San Joaquin Valley is about 250 miles long and about 80 miles wide, averaging, and it is bounded by mount mountain ranges on the east, west, and south. Um, the marine air flows in on the, on the lower on the figure, it shows um, the diagram of uh, the air flows during the day and night. And uh, the marine air flows in through the San Joaquin River Delta, the Bay Area, and topographic features um, restrict the movement down vertically and, and horizontally out, out of the valley. Uh, low mixing heights, especially during winter and stagnant conditions, limit this movement. And this allows pollutants such as PM2.5 to build up and cause exceedances in air quality standards. This shows um, an overview of some of the trends in the San Joaquin Valley. The top view presents uh, the design value, which is, sort of, uh, which is a measure of extreme or, or the higher values averaged over three years in the valley from 1997 through 2017. And you can see that over the First, uh, several maybe decade, um, about um, much progress was made. The um, design value came down 43 percent in the valley, but over the last decade or so, the design value <coughs> has remained more or less bouncing around at the same um, level, which exceeds the national ambient air quality uh, standard of 35 micrograms per cubic meter. So we have a lot of work to do on, on uh, improving this uh, concentration. Um, the PM in the valley is composed more or less of uh, ammonium nitrate and organic aerosol. Uh, the PM 2.5 at least is. And uh, uh, regulatory efforts to comply with particular manager standards in the San Joaquin Valley require improvements in our knowledge of the factors in controlling particle formation transport and precursor sources. The lower um, figure shows um, values that are measured at one site uh, in Fresno. And this shows that most of the exceedances and high values occur during the winter months. And so we, we in particular should concentrate on these in, in our modeling as well. And today's speaker I'd like to introduce is Michael, Dr. Michael Kleeman. He's a professor of civil and environmental engineering at the University of California, Davis. He received his PhD from 
the California Institute of Technology in 1998. His thesis advisor was a renowned uh, Glenn Chaos. And his research similarly spans a wide range of subjects in the atmospheric science, from ozone production, from agricultural sources to interactions between climate, energy, air quality, to characterization and source apportionment of atmospheric ultrafine particles. Today, Dr. Kleeman will talk about some of the work he's done on updates to emission inventories, meteorological conditions, and the description of regional chemical regimes to determine pathways to improving the accuracy of model predictions for PM2.5 and particulate nitrate in the San Joaquin Valley. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Kleeman. Thanks, William, for that introduction, and thanks to everybody for uh, coming out. Uh, this was a collaborative project, really, between ARB and uh, us at the University of California, and I think that I've enjoyed that type of collaborative relationship over the years. Uh, there's a lot of research questions that sort of bounce back and forth between the agencies, uh, and uh, certainly there's a lot of expertise here, but we try to contribute to that as we go along. Um, I want to acknowledge my co-authors on the presentation. Uh, Anna Kendra Kumar is a postdoc working in my group uh, who contributed strongly to all of the research that we'll talk about today. And then Abhishek uh, Demon was a graduate student with us and now actually works for ARB. Uh, and, and Abhishek was very active in this project as well. Um, so William did a great job of framing the overall problem. The San Joaquin Valley is a unique area. It, it uh, only has about 3 million people, but it has air pollution problems that rival those of Los Angeles with 20 million people. And that's in large part due to the geography and the meteorology that keeps the air stagnant in that location. It also has a unique uh, sort of mixture of sources in the valley. There's a very intensive agricultural uh, operation in that location, world renowned. Uh, and so that's a unique feature uh, that we have to consider as well. The, the main components of particulate matter, as William said, are uh, ammonium nitrate, uh, then as well as organic carbon. We're going to be focusing on ammonium nitrate today because of the unique problems that we're having understanding its sources and formation pathways in recent years. And I'm just trying to illustrate uh, some of the typical concentrations for ammonium nitrate uh, in these slides, just taken from um, recent publications, older publications now, uh, where we have uh, concentrations of particulate ammonium nitrate that are up above 60 micrograms per cubic meter back in the years 2000. And uh, you know, that's clearly a problem when the, the standard, the 24-hour standard, used to be 65. It's been lowered since. Uh, and it's a major component of the PM2.5. When we were modeling those episodes back in the year 2000, we had a fair amount of success. We thought that we could capture those high concentrations more or less. I mean, you never have the ability to model anything perfectly in the atmosphere because it's a chaotic place. But we thought we understood the dominant processes, the dominant sources of that particulate nitrate. And as William said, we made a lot of progress. You know, we, we have addressed those sources and we've tried to bring those concentrations down with a lot of success. But we're not there yet. The, the, you know, as we learn more about uh, public health and, and epidemiology, we continually adjust our standards. The standards are going down. We need to reduce the concentrations more now in the future. And the particulate nitrate that we have left is still a problem. It still contributes mm -hmm. strongly to that uh, airborne particulate matter. Now, the problem is that uh, as the concentrations have gone down, our models have gotten less accurate. Uh, so we are no longer able to model particulate nitrate with, say, you know, plus or minus 10% accuracy. Now we're starting to undershoot those predictions, the, what's left of the particulate nitrate problem. We're undershooting that by almost a factor of two. And that's a real problem. Um, you know, if you don't understand, you know, the base case system that you're trying to address, then how can you pose emissions control programs and play what-if games. There's, there's no way to do that unless you think that your models work for the base case system. And so the genesis of this project was really trying to address that failing in recent years as the problems have actually gotten better, our ability to understand what's left of the problem has gotten worse. And we need somehow to address that in our models. No one wants to apply an emissions control program to the wrong sources. No one wants to, you know, incur the cost of the economy for, and, and get it wrong. So there's a lot of, a lot at stake here, and we want to make sure that we do it right. So I, I think I said all of that uh, <laughs> uh, in, in the background slide here. Uh, but it, it's a complicated problem. And it's complicated because particulate nitrate is the end of a very complex set of chemistry uh, in the atmosphere. 
So most of the reactive nitrogen emissions are released to the atmosphere as NO, nitrogen oxide. And then it goes through a whole oxidation cycle that's quite complicated. Uh, and it depends on how much sunlight there is, what the temperature is, and so on, uh, for the efficiency of how much of that reactive nitrogen gets converted over to particulate nitrate. You also need some ammonia in the system in order to neutralize the acid so that it will end up in the particle phase. We, we have a lot of ammonia in the San Joaquin Valley, and, and in past analysis, we've decided that it's probably impractical at this time to try to control particulate nitrate by controlling ammonia. We've done those simulations, and we believe that we still understand that part of the problem. So really what we need to do is understand uh, the sources, the direct emissions, and then the conversion efficiency that moves that NO to the tail of the problem to the particulate nitrate. What's the conversion efficiency for that? And that's a lot of complicated questions just tied up in that and understanding it. And a lot of smart people spend a lot of time trying to think about that and understand it. Some of those solutions are obvious in retrospect, but when you're standing at the beginning of the puzzle, they're not ever obvious. <laughs> so hopefully we will illustrate some potential answers in this seminar and, and that can move us forward in the conversation. I don't think that we've solved this problem by any stretch, but hopefully we're, we're gonna move forward with it. So the research objectives that I wanna talk about today that were uh, inherent in this project uh, were, were three main ones and then a fourth one to evaluate things. We wanted to try to consider whether or not we fully understand the emissions of reactive nitrogen to the atmosphere. You know, it could be that we're under predicting particulate nitrate just because we aren't emitting enough reactive nitrogen. We also then wanted to look at the meteorology because those conversion rates between the emissions of reactive nitrogen to the particulate nitrate are all tied up in meteorology. Is the air stagnant enough? Do you keep it trapped long enough in the valley? Is the temperature right? Have you got the details of the mixing in the atmosphere right? And we're gonna focus on that later on as well. Is the humidity right? All of those things matter in, in that conversion efficiency. And there's a lot of questions. The, the models that we use to try to predict that meteorology are not perfect. And, and so are those imperfections in some way consistently biasing us one way or the other? And then uh, we wanted to, as I said, investigate these nocturnal vertical levels. We thought from the measurements, we still do think from the measurements that we uh, are seeing evidence of formation of nitrate, not at ground level, but at some elevated level in the atmosphere, say a few hundred meters, and then some mixing of that down to the surface afterwards. And that's a really dynamic process that maybe our models hadn't been configured to properly represent before. You know, air quality models are used to dealing with stuff at the ground, and as it gets further up in the atmosphere, it gets progressively less important to us in the health community, at least. And so we need to maybe reconfigure our thinking if we've got some dynamic formation zone elevated that then mixes back down to the ground. That's a whole new trick for models that really hasn't been focused on before. And so that was potentially in play here as well. So depending on how our answers to those three questions evolved, then we were going to come up with some strategy and then evaluate whether or not our improved modeling techniques really worked across the past 20 years. You know, we've been doing this for a long time in the San Joaquin Valley and the sources have changed. Maybe the dominant sort of chemical regimes have changed as well. So whatever we come up with should work equally well in 2000 as it does in 2015. Uh, and otherwise we're, we're introducing new compensating errors to the modeling system, which doesn't help anybody. You know, you need it to be consistent across the years. And so that was a real focus here as well. So I'm gonna try to address each of these four objectives today uh, in 45 minutes or less, and then uh, try to answer any questions uh, and, and hopefully talk about the future where, where this is sort of pointing us to. So to start out in objective one, um, do we just have emissions biases in the system? Is that why we're under predicting nitrogen? And it's complicated to answer because again, there's so many forms of this reactive nitrogen. And so the approach that we decided to take at least as a broad brush first cut was instead of trying to look at each of the individual species within that total reactive nitrogen, just look at all of it together. If you look at all of it together, you kind of take chemistry off the table. Basically, if you're under predicting total reactive nitrogen, then your emissions are probably low, or maybe you've got the transport wrong, where it's, it's mis mixing away too fast, but you don't have to worry about the conversion efficiency from NO to particulate nitrate if you do total reactive nitrogen. There's, there's many different forms of total reactive nitrogen in the system, but a lot of them are really minor. The dominant ones are bolded up here on the screen. It's the NO, the NO2, and the particulate nitrate. Those are the dominant bins. Everything else is sort of a trace level species. 
And so what we're gonna try to do is compare, and we've got measurements of NO, NO2 in particulate nitrate. And so we're gonna try to sum all those measurements up and compare them to what the models predict to see whether or not there's any evidence of a consistent bias. And we think that that's gonna be uh, easier to track. And again, the problem is evolving in time. Back in 2000, we kind of had a handle on this. And in 2015 or later, we, we don't have a handle on it anymore. And so we need to look at multiple years for this comparison. It's not enough to just do one year. We got to try to find trends and, and examine this. So we're going to put all of this in a modeling system then and try to predict reactive nitrogen and compare it to measurements. The emissions are coming from ARB. Uh, we're doing uh, you know, anchor years in 2000, 2010, and 2016. This is uh, you know, part of a larger modeling effort for other things, ultrafine particles. And so we were able to leverage that and, and do uh, this long-term modeling. Um, we're correcting things like mobile sources with MPAC along the way to fine tune for day-to-day -day variability. Uh, the temperature and, and humidity affect the emissions rates of NOx. And so we're, we're correcting for that as we go along. Um, uh, there's some other details of the modeling system that don't necessarily uh, directly affect the uh, reactive nitrogen, but I'll talk about them just really quickly. You know, the residential wood smoke emissions, you know, some of those evaporate. That's a different question. Uh, natural gas combustion emissions, we think the particulate matter of that might evaporate as well once it hits the atmosphere. Not, the NOx is, uh, I think, accurate in those emissions. And then we're doing the um, Megan biogenic emissions and then GFED wildfire emissions for some of the other things to round out a complete uh, simulation of the atmosphere. We're getting boundary conditions, what's blowing into California from a global chemistry model, Mozart. Uh, that's not so important. The, the reactive nitrogen that we see in the valley is in the valley, emitted in the valley. It's, it's not as if you have a lot of background reactive nitrogen that's influencing this question, surface level concentration. The meteorology is coming from uh, simulation, uh, the weather research and forecasting model, uh, and we are applying that in three different domains at uh, 36, 12, and four kilometer resolution, uh, and then uh, 31 vertical layers up to um, high in the atmosphere, 100 uh, uh, hectopascals, I think. And then uh, the details of the, the configuration work there. Uh, some of the people that ran this are probably in the room, so <laughs> I can defer to them for questions if, if, they, um, if there, anything comes up. So the air quality model that we're using for this uh, is a chemical transport model. Uh, we could use CMAC for this, uh, but we are using our own air quality model, the, the UC Davis uh, air quality model, uh, because it, we have more control over that. It's a little bit more flexible. If we want to put more vertical layers in it or add new processes, we can do that quicker than we can in CMAC. Uh, and so we're using that for this purposes. Uh, they're functionally equivalent. They both are reactive chemical transport models that track the emissions the transport, the deposition, and then the chemistry that happens to the individual compounds in the atmosphere. So they're functionally equivalent. We're using the SAPRAC 11 chemical mechanism, um, and then we're representing the particulate matter where nitrate will form with 15 size bins from 10 nanometers up to 10 microns. Uh, we've got all of the processes that you would expect to have in there, coagulation, dynamic gas particle partitioning. Uh, we've got an SOA model and so on. The thermodynamics for uh, what is the predicted level of equilibrium nitrate uh, is being predicted by isoropia. That's a, a acknowledged, accepted standard thermodynamic model in the field. Uh, so we've got some additional features in our modeling system. We can put artificial source tags on things so we can look at where the particulate matter is coming from or where the nitrate is coming from as well. And, and that will help answer some of the questions later on. So one of the things that we will um, have in our discussion today is a, a discussion of a missing source of reactive nitrogen, which is soil NOx emissions. And these are emissions from fertilized soils. Uh, some of the fertilizer, nitrogen-containing fertilizer then, uh, will be uh, re-emitted as uh, various forms of nitrogen, but some of it will be reactive nitrogen that could play a role in the system. Uh, and so, uh, this is a source that is not currently accounted for in ARB inventories, uh, and there were, you know, just by happenstance, then estimates of what these emissions might look like from other researchers at UC Davis, and uh, we saw this. It, it got a lot of attention, and uh, we wondered whether or not it would play a role in our particulate nitrate question. A lot of that um, initial sort of interest in these emissions was around the potential for that to play into ozone chemistry in the summertime because that's when these soil NOx emissions are thought to be highest. But we still think that we have some low level of those happening in the wintertime as well. And that is the main focus of what we're gonna do today. Um, 
There are other estimates of this. This is by no means the only estimate of these emissions. Uh, some of those other estimates are of different magnitude. Some are you know, lower. Uh, I think that uh, this really just introduces the, the concept here. And so I'm gonna refer to these as candidate soil NOx emissions because I do not think that the research on this topic is settled, but it certainly introduces an important question for us to think about and, and really have some soul searching about whether or not we've ignored an important source or not. So, and I'll defer to Ian Faluna for any questions on that. <laughs> so just some really quick simulations then of the uh, reactive nitrogen in the atmosphere. Each row of this refers to a different year. Um, and so we've got 2010 in the top row, we've got 2013 in the middle row, and then we've got 2015 in the bottom row of these results. I've got uh, two different simulations here and then, then difference between those two simulations. One of those simulations is the base case, and that is uh, the middle panel in each of these plots. And you can see that the total reactive nitrogen is focused then in those base case simulations in the urban areas. That's motor vehicles, that's your water heaters, that's everything else that you're burning to produce um, you know, energy is emitting and then that's mostly clustered where the people are. Now, if we look at the left side, this is the same simulation of total reactive nitrogen, but adding the soil NOx emissions that I just discussed. And you can see that you no longer observe the urban hotspots anymore. Now it's very regional, and some of the highest emissions may actually be in rural areas outside of the urban centers. Uh, and then the right panel is just the difference. This is just a, a picture of where um, the soil NOx reactive nitrogen would go in the, in the simulation. So this is just the difference between the two cases. So what you take out of this is that um, the, the soil NOx emissions at least the hypothesized magnitude of them is significant. They, they make an active contribution to reactive nitrogen in the atmosphere. In the urban centers though, you still got these islands, these urban activities. And so if you look at the contributions um, in the locations where you've got the cities, Fresno and Bakersfield, they're only making about 20% of the reactive nitrogen in the urban areas is from soil NOx. They, they dominate in, in the rural areas but in the urban areas, you don't have fertilized soils. You've got cars and trucks. And uh, you're seeing then still the, the urban signal being dominated by the traditional sources, traffic and, and other natural gas combustion and other things. This maybe starts to explain the conflict between how could we have missed such a big source? Because most of our monitors that we think about are in urban areas. And in urban areas, you're not necessarily dominated by this, but they do make a very big regional contribution. So both sides of this argument might be right. There's a way for that to happen that is not necessarily in conflict. So if I look then uh, back to my original question of do I see evidence of a bias in the emissions of total reactive nitrogen, I'm showing then three different years, 2010, 2013, and 2015. The red bars in this plot are the measurements at Fresno, Bakersfield, and Visalia. And then the um, green bars are the model predictions without the soil NOx emissions in them. And what you can see is that as you go forward in time, you're seeing progressively a divergence between the measurements and the model predictions without soil NOx. Those green bars are sort of getting farther away from the red bars. Everything's got uncertainty, and so it's hard to find these, you know, true messages in messy environmental signals, but you've got to somehow try to see through the noise and, and pick up the trends. So as at least in a preliminary view, that is the trend that we observe here. Now, if we add soil NOx to this system, you see a definite increase in the model predictions. In some years, it's over what you would have predicted in, um, or it's over what we measured. In other years, it's, it's closer to what we measured than the, the model predictions um, without soil NOx in them. So the take home messages from this slide are that there definitely is evidence of a missing source of NOx. Whether or not it's soil NOx is still an open question. But just looking at the red bars to the green bars, it is hard to argue that we have all of the reactive nitrogen in the emissions inventory that we're supposed to have. And I don't know, that 
Um, th there aren't that many big sources of NOx that it could be. Again, a lot of smart people spend a lot of time trying to think about what this might be. So uh, we have to sort of come to grips with that, at least one thing, we're missing NOx emissions. Again, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself in the conclusion, so I basically just said all that. We, we look at the total um, reactive nitrogen and uh, we have a bias and that bias gets progressively worse as we go past years in 2010. This is consistent with something like a known source like motor vehicles getting cleaned up and then the residual source is uh, sort of not being accounted for correctly, but it gets more exposed over time as the traditional sources go away. All right, so we wanted to shift gears before we really committed to that pathway and think about the meteorology. Is there any evidence that somehow we're predicting the wind speeds wrong, the mixing wrong, the humidity wrong, something that might be you know, systematically buying, biasing us low in the prediction of particulate nitrate in the atmosphere? So we started out by trying to look at how we're configuring WARF. We did some sensitivity studies on uh, the planetary boundary layer schemes and uh, the land surface schemes to make sure that we thought that we were able to represent the planetary boundary layer correctly. And we, we thought that we, we got that worked out more or less. And then uh, we focused on the humidity in the atmosphere because again, this conversion efficiency from the raw NO emissions over to the particulate nitrate emissions depends on a lot of things. The last step of it relies on being able to have water to interact with that form of reactive nitrogen, which turns out to be N205 is the dominant one. That's sort of the last step in the process. That N205 needs some liquid water uh, in order to really uh, efficiently convert over to particulate nitrate. So if you have uh, meteorological simulations that are too dry in your model study, then you're going to underpredict this conversion efficiency because of that. Now again, working with collaborators at A or B, uh, you know, there are a lot of smart people have been thinking about this problem. Uh, we focused in on the uh, soil moisture now, not soil NOx, but soil moisture. And the hypothesis that was being tested was that uh, the soil moisture was too low in the wharf model simulations. We weren't accounting for all of the irrigation that might be happening in some of the cropland. And that would influence then the humidity to be too low in the atmosphere, which would uh, bias the conversion efficiency. And so tests had been done at A or B, uh, and, and we conducted tests likewise in this program to try to look at that question. And we made consistent changes to the soil moisture, increasing that index from 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 uh, with A or B to see what would happen. Now our wharf model configurations were different than theirs. And, and so uh, whereas they might have had a, a little bit of a low bias in their humidity, we, we didn't so much have that. So the effects were different in the two efforts. Just to give you a quick idea again of where this is gonna happen then, uh, we were increasing that, that moisture index for irrigated croplands. This is type 38. These are just the 40 different uh, land use types in WARF. And so 40, uh, 38 is the, the red here. I mean, you're, it's no surprise, right? You're seeing it over the San Joaquin Valley, the, the irrigated cropland. And so um, the same locations that emit soil NOx, hypothetically, potentially, are the places where the soil moisture maybe had been understated and, and we would be increasing it. So we're gonna get the same locations, uh, but, but different sort of mechanisms of action here in, in this sensitivity study. Now, if I look at um, the effects of this on the right side to start with, um, increasing that soil moisture led to approximately a 5% increase in the relative humidity in the atmosphere in the first level of the model. And that makes sense, right? You have more water at the ground, then you're gonna get more water in the atmosphere and, and things will be wetter. The, the issue though for us is that we already had 80% relative humidity in the model calculations. And so we were not biased low relative to the measurements and adding 5% more didn't really make that much of a difference because we, we already had enough water in the simulation to facilitate that last step of the conversion to particulate nitrate. It wasn't a rate limiting step for us. If we had been at 50% relative humidity or 40% relative humidity, we'd be having a different conversation, but that's not where we were at. So you can see things then, um, this is just a picture of the mean fractional bias for the relative humidity in the first two bars. Uh, and then you're seeing that uh, we, we might've been biased slightly low and, and increasing the soil moisture here in the second bar addressed some of that, but 
Again, slightly low is, is not that big a deal when you already were at 80%. It, it wasn't critical. Uh, it reduced the temperature slightly by doing that. The, the temperature uh, sort of came down a little bit, and that addressed some bias. Um, and then the wind speed actually uh, went up a little bit, or I'm sorry, went down a little bit as well. So, and, and that, but that made the bias a little bit worse. So the details uh, of that sort of aren't as important as the realization that the, the system was already wet enough to, uh, to have that con uh, conversion efficiency be efficient. So this is a noisy plot. I'm going to try to walk you through the different lines. This is time on the lower axis. And this is for uh, an intensive field campaign that we were running in 2013, uh, the, the Discover AQ campaign. Uh, and so I've got the observations here as the purple line, the highest uh, bar. Uh, and this is particulate nitrate on the vertical axis. And so if you look at the purple line then, the particulate nitrate was uh, peaking out between 20 and 25 microamps per cubic meter, sort of off and on throughout this multi-day episode that we're tracking. We'd like our models to be able to do that. If I look at the base case simulation then, the blue line, uh, that's sort of what we started with. And then uh, the line with soil moisture would be the green line. What you'll notice if you stare at this uh, for a few minutes is that the, the green line and the blue line are almost on top of each other. It's very hard to distinguish them on this plot. We, we really didn't have a big noticeable impact on things by increasing that soil moisture. Um, you know, there were some differences. It made some increase in the conversion efficiency, but it wasn't a game changer, I guess. It didn't really noticeably move us towards the purple line. Just for comparison then, there, there is some base with soil knocks in here, the red line, and you do see episodes where that goes quite a bit above the, um, the case with humidity. So if you're comparing the sensitivity of the system for those two systems, the soil knocks makes more difference than the soil moisture in, in our analysis. And again, that's subject to the modeling assumptions that we made and the configurations of the models that we use. Uh, all of this has to be a sort of weight of evidence approach, so we're providing one sort of data point in that weight of evidence. So again, I'm always ahead of myself, but the conclusion from that study was that uh, soil moisture was not a really strong driver of particulate nitrate formation in our simulations. All right, now the, the third objective was to understand this potential for really efficient zones of particulate nitrate formation in the upper atmosphere that then mixed down to the ground. And so we're going to focus a lot on an episode where we have some vertical profiles of reactive nitrogen uh, in different forms, NO, and, and particulate nitrate, and some other species uh, that were measured during the Discovery AQ campaign with aircraft. And this is you know, what you need to do if you want to you know, test hypotheses about vertical sort of profiles of pollutants in the atmosphere in efficient formation zones. You need some measurements up there to try to facilitate that. So we are going to be working again with our UCD air quality model. The standard model resolution is 16 vertical levels up to five kilometers. And as a part of this research program, uh, we increase that to 42 levels up to five kilometers, trying to really resolve. These levels are usually telescoping. So the first level is 30 meters, the second level is 60 meters, 120 meters, and so on. Well, if your really efficient zone of nitrate formation is at 300 meters and it's narrow, by that time, you've got a 200 meter sort of vertical level thickness. You're not going to resolve that very well. So the idea was to try to get 42 levels in there to better resolve whatever might be happening in the upper atmosphere so that we don't completely wash it out before we mix it back down to the ground. And, and so that's why we're trying to do it. On the pathway to that, we found all the skeletons in the closet. So all the things in the model that affect mixing that maybe weren't important when you're focusing on pollutants that are close to the ground, but that come to light when you're caring about these types of questions. So, you know, minimum values for the, the turbulent diffusion coefficient, KZZ, at nighttime. Um, how you treat KZZ above the mix depth in neutral stability conditions turned out to be a huge thing as well. I'll point that out as we go along. All the skeletons came out, and we were trying to track all that down and tried to make the best simulation that we could. We are going to include the candidate soil NOx emissions in this, again, because we think that they're potentially important. And, the evidence that we saw in the first two objectives suggested that they should be part of this conversation. And so that they'll be part of this analysis. So this is just a really quick uh, plot of time series again over the January and February 2013 on the, the lower axis. And then you've got the concentrations of different pollutants on the vertical axis. 
PM2.5 mass total, and then nitrate in the PM2.5 ammonium ion, sulfate, and then gas phase, ozone, NOx, and CO. So this is not supposed to be an eye test. You know, there's measurements on here and different um, variations on the model simulations. The ones that I'll focus on on model simulations are the base one with the standard vertical resolution and no soil NOx, and then the base uh, one with standard vertical resolution with soil NOx added, and then the high vertical resolution with soil NOx added. And I'll use these short forms, base, base soil, and high res soil to indicate those. Now, it's again hard to, um, to interpret a messy environmental signal, and so you either have to do a bunch of statistics on this or maybe uh, average it to come up with an average diurnal profile. And so we followed the lead of some of the other Discover AQ researchers, and we kind of focused on that. So if I take all of those days that were on the last slide, and I create an average day out of them to, to look at an average 24-hour period during this measurement campaign, what does that look like? And again, I've got PM2.5 mass here, PM2.5 nitrate, PM2.5 ammonium ion, and then gas phase NOx, ozone, and CO. And it's hour of the day now on the lower axis. This is your average day. Um, and what we we're trying to focus on is the, the green line here is the, the observations, the measurements of the particulate nitrate. And you saw this bump coming up around, uh, you know, between 10 and, uh, and, and noon every morning, this rise of the particulate nitrate concentration measured at the ground. And, you know, we, I was in the meetings where we debated this. Uh, you know, is that chemistry? Do you see local chemistry kicking off? Can it be that fast? Is that plausible? And you know, what I really put forward strongly was that this is evidence of an elevated layer of efficient nitrate formation that is happening at night. And then as the mixing depth comes up during the day, you mix that down to the ground and you're seeing it at the ground manifest as this sort of bump up at 10, 11 in the morning. But it's not local chemistry. It's actually just you're, you're getting that what I call the Goldilocks zone where you've got just the right amount of ozone and NOx together to form nitrate efficiently, getting finally mixed down to the ground at that time of the day. So we're trying very hard then to see if we can represent that. Our base case model representations don't do a good job of that at all. So this is the um, high res with soil. The peak happens uh, early in the morning. Uh, you don't see this mid-morning sort of towards noon peak. Uh, and then the base soil and, and then the base, you know, they, they just don't pick it up. And so all of the evidence then suggests that our original modeling system wasn't doing this correctly. And what could we change to try to, to get this? Even the, the high vertical resolution wasn't doing a great job of trying to pick that up. So we looked at the uh, vertical profiles then uh, of things directly. Uh, so this is a plot now of the concentration on the lower axis of each plot and then altitude on the vertical axis. And these are uh, flights that were happening at sort of regular intervals at some of the locations, we're focusing on Fresno. So I'm showing the 10 a.m. flights averaged over every day of this Discovery AQ uh, to, to start with. And the nitrate profile, if I look at the observations, they're again in green. Um, you're seeing sort of um, high concentrations uh, sort of decreasing as you go up in the atmosphere. Uh, it turns out that at 10 a.m., a lot of this has already happened. You saw that peak was happening sort of 10, 11 a.m. in the morning a lot of the sort of mixing of that Goldilocks zone down to the surface has already happened. And so that's why it looks flat here uh, with elevation is because it's already mixed. You've kind of missed the story already by flying at 10 a.m. And I understand why they do that, you know, because it's hard to fly airplanes and it's harder to fly them at night and you have gotta get permission to do these things, these spirals over cities. And so there's good reasons for why it was done that way, but that's a limit to the study. You really need those profiles measured at night or certainly in the early morning. 10 a.m., you've already kind of missed the story for a lot of what's happening. Uh, so, you know, we're trying to represent that, but it's not, not too helpful to, to look at this picture. Uh, and then as you go uh, later in the day, you just see that mixing depth going up even more. So you're seeing, again, uh, it rising up even further now. We're at, um, if I look at the NOx as a signal, you're at 400 meters or, or 500 meters of elevation of mixing depth, and it, it just keeps going up. As, as the day goes on. And then this is the, um, oh, I went the wrong way. This is the 2 p.m. one, uh, and the same sort of story going on. 
All right, so we, we turned and looked at the model results instead. Uh, it's always dangerous to use a model to try to understand a system. Usually I try to understand a system for measurements and then see if I can get the model to represent it. But at least I wanted to see why couldn't our model pick up these nocturnal levels. And so this is the base simulation with soil. This is the same format of plot. I've got altitude on the vertical axis and I've got concentration on this axis. We're looking at particulate nitrate. Every line now is a different hour of the day. Uh, and we kind of bend them because 24 lines were a little bit too messy. And so we've got hours one to four, hours five to eight, nine to 12, and so on uh, represented here. And what I can see is that uh, in the, say the hour range from five to eight in the morning, I do see some evidence of efficient nitrate formation. Uh, and it's happening at say about 150 meters of elevation in the model simulations. That's all remember again before the plane was able to fly there. And the problem with this though, that I initially was trying to uh, work with Abhishek to address was that the nighttime concentrations were being over predicted at ground level. We do have 24 hours of ground level measurements and that 12 micrograms per cubic meter of nitrate at ground level was a little bit too much. That's above what the monitors were saying. And so that got us thinking about the minimum you know, vertical turbulent diffusion coefficients that we were employing in the model. Maybe they weren't low enough. And so we started to uh, try to ponder that. But I guess we, in this one, we're looking at the, the vertical resolution. This is with just the, the standard 15 bins uh, vertical levels. And then if we do 42 vertical levels, were we able to better resolve that? And so we do see a sharper resolution of that and, and you see instead of 12 micrograms or, or 14 micrograms per cubic meter, when you have increased vertical resolution, you get 20 micrograms per cubic meter in that what I called the Goldilocks zone originally, where you have just the right mixture of ozone and, and NOx getting together to form nitrate efficiently. Uh, but again, we're over predicting the ground level concentrations. And, and again, that made us wonder whether or not we've got too much mixing uh, below uh, the, um, that, that Goldilocks zone. So what we did then was to um, adjust the minimum uh, in our vertical turbulent diffusion coefficients down from 0.5 meters squared per second to 0.01 meters squared per second. And that did lower the uh, ground level concentrations uh, and, and it still preserved that sort of uh, zone of efficient nitrate formation, but we still had evidence of something else weird going on especially in this, uh, what's co coded as the gold period here, the nine to 12, you know, we really saw that whole thing being destroyed without producing the dynamic signal at the ground that we thought where we should see evidence of, of the mixing level coming up slowly and eating into this and mixing it down to the ground. It seems like we were just losing it entirely in just in one shot and something was wrong there, another skeleton in the closet. And so what we did was, um, Again, go back and look at the vertical turbulent diffusion coefficients now, but not now the minimum level that we were imposing at nighttime, but the uh, level that was being used throughout the whole atmospheric column under different stability conditions. As you go from nighttime with very stable atmosphere uh, through a neutral stability condition in the mid-morning through more of a turbulent stability condition in the afternoon, uh, somehow that transition wasn't being represented correctly. And what we discovered was that um, our KZZ formulations, the turbulent diffusion coefficients, uh, had been sort of geared for another scenario uh, where the mixing height was quite high, you know, maybe a three kilometer mixing height or something like that. And the details of what happened above that weren't so important. And so people just made some sort of assumption about what to set KZZ to above that mixing height. In this system, that's not the case. That mixing height is, starts at the ground and works its way up during the day and as you transition into that neutral stability class, what it was doing was setting a, a very large KZZ value above the, the mixing height, and that took the lid off the box. Basically, you lost everything as you transition through neutral stability. Everything just sort of started mixing away immediately, which is not what happens in reality in the atmosphere. So we changed that formulation. This is a skeleton in our closet, not in CMAX. Uh, this is maybe the danger of using your own research model is that uh, you, you have to find all these things. Um, well, we found that and we fixed it. And then uh, if I wanna point out this hour eight line here in the original treatment, where all of this gold Goldilocks zone, this efficient formation zone that I'm seeing in the nighttime hours is just completely destroyed in one hour in the black line here. When I change the formulation above uh, in the, the neutral atmospheric stability conditions, then the black line sort of still mirrors things. And I'm seeing now, if I look at my ground level concentrations, 
a sort of a peak at eight o'clock in the morning as that mixes down to the ground. Instead of just destroying it all and mixing it all away, it, it dynamically, I hope, captures the system that we're trying to represent with this. So this is the games you start playing when you try to represent these things. This is Air quality models traditionally haven't been used to try to resolve these upper layers and then mix it back down to the ground in this level of detail. You know, this is a very dynamic system, lots of chemistry going on. It's a pretty complicated situation. So we're kind of pushing these models a little bit to handle these next set of questions that we're asking them. So if I do all of that, what happens? Well, this again is my same average day at the ground level. I'm looking again, uh, hour of the day on the lower axis. I've got the PM 2.5 mass here, but the one I really care about is the nitrate in the upper right here. And again, the, the original line for the measurements are the same. It's the green line here that I'm tracing. Uh, and then the original model formulations weren't able to catch any of that. The red line is what happens when I do the high resolution, vertical resolution with the modified treatment of the mixing in, under neutral stability conditions. I'm starting to get a morning bump. It's not at the right hour. Uh, you know, it's at 8 a.m. instead of at uh, 10 or 11 a.m. But at least we're getting there. So we think that we're starting to capture the dynamics of this, what you see. And we think that the hypothesis is right, that there is a nocturnal layer with very efficient nitrate production, and that is mixing down to the ground. That is part of this. I don't know whether it's all of it, but it's part of it. And, and you need to do things to your chemical transport model in order to try to resolve it if you want to answer these types of questions. All right, so um, again, just comparing the vertical profiles to uh, the measurements uh, for different configurations of the model, but in the interest of time, I, I won't belabor that too much. Uh, you know, we, we think that we're doing a better job by, by changing the representation of this. And, and we think that CTMs can do this. They just need to be, I guess, worked with to, to try to capture all of the processes that are going on. All right, so now we think that we understand something, we think that we, have some soil NOx emissions that maybe haven't been properly accounted for. We think we need to do some things to our vertical treatment of mixing in the model to capture things. You know, if that's true, then if those are real, then we should be able to simulate episodes uh, in multiple years, not just one year. We shouldn't be tuning models to one episode in 2013, but we should be able to go in multiple years and still have it work. And so, so how are we doing? And we especially want to look at ozone. Um, you know, this project was about nitrate, but we're hypothesizing about soil NOx emissions, and are those going to mess up the comparisons to the ozone predictions? Because that, that will have big impacts. And, and you know, do we see evidence that somehow the soil NOx emissions can't be right because we just completely mess up the predictions for ozone in the summertime? So to start with, I'll look at the um, fractional bias for the PM2.5 nitrate with and without soil NOx. And so the case on the right here is without soil NOx. This is our base case. Fractional bias is a statistical measure. You'd like it to be zero. That means your model is perfect. If it's above zero, it means that you're overpredicting. If it's below zero, it means that you're underpredicting. And so what you can see, as, and it, it's plotted here as a function of measured concentration on the vertical axis. What you can see in this plot is that at all the high concentration events, uh, we're underpredicting nitrate in the base case simulation. That, we already knew that. It's just a different way of making a picture to show it. In the left plot, then, I add soil NOx emissions, and I'm still underpredicting nitrate in all of the high concentration events. Not underpredicting it quite as badly, uh, and I, I definitely have moved the average mean fractional bias in the right direction, uh, but now, you know, I, I still got a lot of scatter in that. What I take out of this is that we by no means have captured all the variability in this system. There's something, other things that are going on. And I, I have to say that, you know, the Soil NOx emissions that we put in were one estimate. It wasn't tuned by year, wasn't tuned for what's a drought year and what's not a drought year. It wasn't tuned for crop changes or anything like that. It was a really quick look at this issue. So I think that you know, potentially there's a lot of room for improvement there in terms of that biogeochemical model or a biogeochemical model like that one that produced these soil NOx emissions being run in a way to try to resolve that year-to-year -year variability, or even month-to-month -month variability. That could make a big difference. So then in terms of um, particulate nitrate predictions, how are we doing? So these are, again, 
our model simulations. This is for January in the years 2010, 2013, and 2015. The red bars, again, are measurements uh, at all the sites in the San Joaquin Valley. And then the green simulations are done without soil NOx emissions. And again, you see this sort of progressive divergence from the measurements, things getting worse and worse over time. And then the blue bars are the ones that are done with soil NOx emissions. Uh, so, you know, again, it's not perfect. In some years, the soil NOx pushes things a little higher than the measurements. In other years, it looks better. Uh, so, again, um, we think that they, there's evidence that there's improvement with soil NOx emissions, but we don't think that the soil NOx emissions have been refined enough to, to really capture the full system. Or there could be something else that's going on, and, and we haven't represented it yet. So, again, we by no means claim that we've solved all the problems. This is just a look at uh, the effects on the NOx concentrations. So again, I've got 2010, 2013, 2015. The color coding is the same. I've got the uh, red representing measurements, and then the green representing the simulations without the soil NOx emissions, and the blue representing the simulations with soil NOx emissions. I've switched to a log scale on the vertical axis here. A lot of the um, ambient concentrations follow a log normal distribution, and so that's, that's why we did that. It makes it a little bit harder to, to compare uh, the, the bottom line is that uh, it's a similar story to the particulate nitrate, um, where adding soil NOx definitely increases those concentrations. In some years, it looks like it does a little better compared to measurements, and some years a little bit worse. It certainly doesn't blow things up. There is no evidence that somehow, oh my gosh, it, it couldn't be right, because these are just so far in outer space. It, it, it doesn't do that at all. This is just a map of where those NOx concentrations are occurring. Uh, again, so this is a, a similar uh, system that I had uh, plotted before. I've got uh, 2010 in the first row, 2013 in the middle row, and then 2015 in the bottom row. I've got the base case um, soil NOx concentrations on the left side of things here, where you see the urban centers uh, sort of really standing out. Uh, this is without soil NOx predictions on the left side. And then these are the the additions from soil NOx, and again, you're seeing the, the large additions in the rural areas uh, between Fresno and Bakersfield uh, in the agricultural settings. That has an impact then um, on the particulate nitrate formation. So if I look at particulate nitrate formation in those different years, uh, 2000, 2005, 2010, 2013, and 2015, uh, I believe these are all uh, Januaries uh, in those years. Uh, you, you again see the the peaks are sort of happening, uh, big regional peaks between the cities. So you're getting um, a, a big signal there. There's a lot of year-to-year -year variability. You know, we had droughts in here. We had, we had some pretty strong climatic things happen uh, in these years. And so you're seeing significant variability uh, on top of long-term trends. And, and that's part of what makes it uh, so hard to look at. The one thing I will point out, the highest variability is in the rural areas. The urban centers, again, seem to be more consistent uh, across that time period. So one of the things that wasn't so obvious about that last plot, but if you do the math to look at it, uh, the soil NOx only contributes around 20% of the reactive nitrogen in the urban areas, but it accounts for almost 50% of the particulate nitrate. And that happens because the conversion efficiency of the soil NOx is higher than the conversion efficiency of the urban NOx. Every NO molecule that gets pushed to particulate nitrate needs two ozone molecules to do it. You gotta push it to NO2, and then you gotta push it to NO3, and then the NO2 and NO3 can get together and it kinda goes on its own from there. But you need two molecules of ozone to push every nitrogen molecule to particulate nitrate. If you're in an urban area with, with pretty high NOx concentrations, you don't have enough ozone to do that efficiently. But if you're in a rural area with lower overall NOx, it's more efficient because you don't quench all your ozone just getting it to NO2 or quench all of your ozone before you can push it all the way to NO3. And so that conversion efficiency is higher in rural areas than it is in urban areas. And that manifests then what I think that we're seeing in these simulations at least we can discuss whether or not that's reality, is that all of that rural NOx that's being emitted converts more efficiently to particulate nitrate, and then that blows over the cities. And you're seeing that form. And maybe that happens as a nocturnal residual layer sort of mixes down in the mid-morning. 
Those things don't sit over Fresno. Those things are moving around. So it's a complicated system. <laughs> and, and we think that we're understanding pieces of it, but there's a lot of dynamic stuff happening. It's all pushing in different directions. One of the implications of that is that you should think about conversion efficiency when you think about different NOx sources, whether you want to call it soil NOx or not. I think it is a true observation that the conversion efficiency for all NOx sources will not be equal. And you should contemplate that. It really means that you need to do reactive chemical transport modeling. You can't just base these things off emissions inventories when you start apportioning sort of responsibility for the particular nitrate problem. All right, so then just some source apportionment results. Uh, these are simulations just for discovery AQ, so just for one time period. Uh, this is the regional nitrate concentration predicted in that uh, 2013 episode. Uh, this is on-road gasoline here on the top left. We're seeing around um, two micrograms per cubic meter uh, with the yellow here. On-road diesel, around two micrograms per cubic meter again. Uh, then we've got the off-road diesel, uh, maybe a little bit less than that, maybe about one and a half to two micrograms per cubic meter. And then we've got the soil NOx, uh, the candidate soil NOx emissions in these episodes coming in at around six to eight micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, the, the peaks are sort of happening in different places, but um, making strong contribution. So regionally then, about half of the particulate nitrate is coming from soil NOx in these simulations, the candidate soil NOx emissions. And again, there's more research that needs to be done about seasonality, about year-to-year uh, -year variability, maybe even the biogeochemical model itself, uh, but it's certainly a source that I think is real and that should be included in A or B emissions inventories accurately in the future. Um, so I think that's a true conclusion. Then one of the things I said I wanted to do was to look at whether or not these soil NOx emissions could be messing up ozone concentrations. You know, just like in the wintertime, how NOx can quench ozone, in the summertime, NOx can quench ozone as well, uh, you know, depending on the, where you are in the isoplast. And so you, you might uh, have some effect on ozone concentrations. Are we making things worse in a way that suggests that those soil NOx emissions are implausible? So we did simulations in July now, not January, July of 2010, 2013, and 2015 over the San Joaquin Valley. And I created an annual or I'm sorry, an average diurnal profile again. So I've got hour of the day here on the lower axis, and I've got ozone concentration on the vertical axis. And these are all the sites that are, have ozone measurements in the San Joaquin Valley. The measurements are in the red here. You get a nice diurnal profile, peak in somewhere between 11 and uh, you know, 1,500 hours. That's, that's pretty normal. And then the model predictions without the uh, soil knocks are here in the green. We see that we're over predicting ozone at night and we are under predicting ozone during the day in these simulations. And then if I add in the soil NOx, you see the blue line here, we're actually doing a better job overall, I think, in representing that diurnal profile. So again, this is with the SAPRAC 11 chemical mechanism, pretty standard chemical mechanism that we use for regulatory modeling. Uh, it certainly doesn't look like we're blowing things up by adding soil NOx to this simulation. Now, if you look at the NOx profiles, you know, there, there's more of a little bit more of a mixed message there uh, again, the observations are in red here. You see kind of a unique profile um, where things are really peaking here in the, the morning hours. This is probably the traffic signal on top of the, the other diurnal profile that's going on. With the soil NOx emissions, you know, we did pretty well throughout a lot of the day, but not late at night and, and not um, early morning. So that really dead of night hours, we see some issues there. Again, this was a really quick look at the candidate soil NOx emissions. We did not have diurnal profiles really tuned up here. We didn't have seasonal variability or year-to-year -year variability. I think there's some room there for uh, some refinement of these models. Uh, but again, I look at this and we're not blowing up the NOx simulations somehow by saying that we've got soil NOx in the model. There's no strong evidence that we're, um, we're really breaking things. And in fact, the comment that I've made all along is that you know, we went into this very neutral, you know, does this matter or not? Do we see, test the hypothesis, does it blow things up or not? Uh, it looks like it fixes more things than it breaks by adding soil NOx emissions to these simulations. And, and I think we all have to just take that as a one thing in the weight of evidence and decide whether or not we want to do more research on this or not. So I can quote some statistics, but this is a boring table, so you can look at it afterwards. So uh, just a really quick picture then of the, um, you know, the regional impact of the NOx concentrations then, um, 
uh, looking at where the NOx is happening. We, we looked at this already, I think, in July. But then looking in July at where the ozone changes happen. If this is the base case ozone, uh, then on the left panels here in 2010, 2013, 2015, and then uh, this is the, the change that's induced by adding the, the NOx. This is 24-hour ozone, so it's a little bit of a weird indicator. It's not daily maximum or eight-hour maximum or anything like that. So it's sort of a weird indicator. Uh, but you're seeing, again, that you're quenching the ozone in the locations where the soil NOx is being emitted. So you're seeing lower concentrations. A lot of that's happening at night. Uh, so you're really quenching things in, in the evening hours when that NOx is, the atmosphere is not well mixed and the NOx has a chance to titrate the ozone. All right, so, um, and I seem to not have slides anymore. So bear with me a second. Technical difficulties, I think I'm done anyway. So let me just try to wrap up uh, the conclusions. You know, we uh, tested the hypothesis um, that emissions might be low in the San Joaquin Valley, and that's contributing to particulate nitrate under predictions. And we saw some evidence of that when we looked at reactive nitrogen. Total reactive nitrogen looks like it's low, and the divergence is getting worse as you go forward in time. And that's consistent with something like a dominant traditional signal like motor vehicles being controlled. And then as things change, you're exposing a missing source in the inventory. What that missing source might be, I'm not prepared to conclude today. but. We looked at soil NOx as one potential source of that. We worked with a candidate soil NOx inventory, and all of the measurements seem to uh, agree in rough terms with the impact of that candidate soil NOx emissions on simulations of particulate nitrate and on ozone. So we think that there's evidence there, and we think that it's a question that merits more investigation. The things that we think need to be improved moving into the future are, you know, the seasonality. You know, are, what are soil NOx emissions in the wintertime? We, a lot of the focus has been on the summer. There's definitely we get higher soil NOx emissions in the summertime due to the biogeochemical cycles. But the winter times are they low? And, and what controls that? What, you know, what are the levels? Uh, we think that the year-to-year -year variability, is it a drought year? Does that affect things or not? You know, th there's a lot of questions that need to be respond, um, you know, studied there further. And can that explain some of the residual scatter that are in these model results? Is that explaining why there's still a lot of sort of uh, divergence uh, from, uh, or I'd call it scatter, I guess, between model predictions and simulation? So we, we think it's part of the, the problem um, that needs to be addressed. Nocturnal residual le levels are real. I mean, I think that that's pretty clear that you're getting some formation of nitrate in those upper levels. It's probably happening between 100 to 300 meters above the surface and then it's mixing down to the surface as the mixing depth comes up during the day. And if we want our chemical transport models to understand all of the processes that control nitrate, we gotta configure our transport models to represent that phenomenon. And I think that that also is a real conclusion. Uh, the rest of it will get online <laughs> if there's anything that I forgot. So with that, uh, thank you guys all for coming and I'll be happy to try to answer any questions. Use the microphone so the audience can hear you. Intimate setting, but I'll use the microphone. I, uh, I think we might have a lot of web users. Hello. Ah, uh, that's right. Okay. Uh, so the first clarification is I was just surprised by the assumption of 80% relative humidity. That is at what uh, altitude or at, at, at what? Layer uh, in so the 80% the the relative humidity was the surface layer, and then that wasn't an assumption. That was uh, measurements, and then the model predictions. Mm -hmm. So our, our model predictions were sort of around that 80% level. I quoted one number, but I can give you the mm -hmm. diurnal profile of that, and, and so on. It, it's obviously a variable that changes throughout the day. Mm -hmm. How 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 deep is that? How how high is that? I, again, I don't remember the details oh, okay. of that, so I, I, I just grabbed the surface level one, which was the plot that I had, so I, okay. I didn't, uh, but I'm happy to, to find that for you and, and we can discuss it. Okay, I was ju just asking about that by sure. the by. Um, the other question was um, the error bars, which is to say probably the uncertainties in the model simulations, those were the product of uncertainties or ranges in the parameters that, that were being fed into the models? 
Uh, so you're looking probably the uh, these ones, uh, this type of error bar, yeah, perhaps, yeah. right? So again, because we're looking at entire months, then you get a, you know, it's hard to represent a whole month with one number. So right. you're looking at the uh, variability in the month. So these, these are not estimates of model error. These are estimates of the variability in either the measurements um. or the model predictions. And so you can see the measurements have error bars as well because there's right. not one number describing the whole month. You get a, a whole thing. So I could draw a distribution. I can make a box and whisker plot. You know, somehow you try to convey there's a mean, but then how much scatter is there about the mean? And that's, that's oh, okay, what these that's the point. Represent. Yeah, I, I had missed that. Thank you. Sure. You're welcome. Any other questions from the audience? Thanks so much for all your work on this. Um, so the candidate uh, soil NOx inventory, uh, is that Almaraz and all? Yeah, that's the image model. Okay. Uh, and again, uh, one of the co-authors on that study is in the room with us, so I'll defer to him for detailed questions. But yes, that is the model we're talking about. We, we also looked, there was another publication that came out uh, while we were debating this back and forth. Uh, and um, that, that model, I think, predicted slightly lower emissions of soil NOx. But again, emissions that you would care about. You know, that if, you know, the current estimate is that the soil NOx accounts for half of the nitrate in the San Joaquin Valley, you can reduce that by some amount and still be at a level where you care about it. So I think that the emissions from that other independent work, that other group, were still indicating soil NOx emissions at a level that you would care about. Okay, great. And um, so just looking for that missing piece. So if it's not soil NOx, where's the next place you're going to look? That's a good question. Um, I think that there's... Actually, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm still exhausted from contemplating this one, honestly. Uh, I th think that um, there, the next low-hanging fruit is to fully test this. I think that there are things that one could do that would pose a hypothesis that could be easily tested. This is not something that should continue to really be a scientific question. I, I think we can make some simple measurements, even, that won't cost a lot that can answer this. I can already see evidence in the measurements we already made that maybe we didn't look at in that, through that lens before. But if I look at them now, I already see evidence of it, that this is real. And I, I think we need to confirm that. That's, that's the next low-hanging fruit to work on. And, and because soil NOx is biologically driven, it becomes harder to measure um, with a lot of accuracy. Well, I think anytime you involve biology, uh, just things get messy. I, it's very, very uncertain. And so whether that's in a biogeochemical system in the soil or if that's in the human body, uh, you know, anytime you involve biology, you need larger numbers of things to, to try to get more, better statistics to really understand trends. And, and so we'll face that challenge. But again, I don't think that those are insurmountable. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So I have a question of your diurnal cycle of uh, particle nitrate. Mm -hmm. So you show uh, the partic particulate nitrate increases uh, at about 10 a.m. Did you see that every day, or is that a campaign average? This is the campaign average. How long is the campaign? Uh, so this is the Discovery AQ campaign. So it's January. Um, well, I think this plot was made for only five days. Some of these five simulations days. were kind of heavy. and so. You know, we were running them as long as we could, but uh, as always, we try to do too much science and then we end up short on the deadlines or whatever. So we, we, we got as many days as we could into this simulation. So this looks like it was just five days. Five days. Yeah. But I, I believe, you know, these results are typical. <laughs> That's a dangerous thing. Typical. Statement. So have you looked at how wind direction shift, um, wh whether the wind direction shift can cause this? Because it looks like uh, uh, the wind direction shifts in the morning. Um, whether this can be caused by a land and sea breeze circulation? Well, in the San Joaquin Valley, I, my mental model for this, again, and I'm not the meteorologist on the team, but my mental model for this is that uh, things are just kind of sloshing around. There's, uh, in these stagnation episodes at least, uh, there's not really a repeatable, strong sort of land sea breeze type of system set up here. 
That's a little bit different than the South Coast Air Basin. I think in the South Coast Air Basin, when you have these stagnation episodes, you still get sort of a land sea breeze type of thing going on. But in the Semikine Valley, the way that it sets up, when you really cap things off with a high level inversion and, and then things stagnate for weeks even, that you, you don't get that sort of as much of a repeatable. So we, we looked at so many things on this. I, you know, I, I imagine we contemplated that at one point. We were thinking about whether power plants could be, you know, bringing things in aloft and then it could be mixing down. I mean, we looked at so many things on this. Um, you know, the ones that I present here are the ones that we think withstood the hypothesis testing. Um, I, I don't think that what you're describing is necessarily dominant in the system. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, once again, great work. Um, I have kind of one specific question, especially on this graph here. Uh, what do you think the CO increases from? And the second question is much more general, like with the soil NOx, is this fertilizer driven? Is this just something that would be happening without the ag? Or can we do something to control the amount of fertilizer or nitrate, or, or is, is that? I'm, I'm going to uh, answer the first question, and then I'm going to defer on the second question. Uh, maybe Ian, who is holding a microphone, will, will pick it up, but I, I certainly am not going to try to answer the second one. But uh, with the first one, I think that the measurements coming up here for CO of, uh, in the mid-morning, that's motor vehicles and water heaters and, and stoves. You know, people get up, and, and all that activity happens in short order. So. You have a shower, you have breakfast, you jump in your car. You know, it's hard to sometimes tease out the 30 minutes of difference between those two things with an atmospheric measurement made a mile away. So I think it's just human activity coming up with combustion as people wake up in the morning. With the second question, again, the details of the biogeochemical model and, and what the solutions are, I think that um, there's a lot of experts that are contemplating that now. And uh, you know, I, I defer to them. I, I, I'm not the biogeochemical expert on the team either. So just the short answer is it's coming from fertilizer application according to the model. So if you look in the Almaraz et al. paper that he referenced, they, we outlined some ideas for simple solutions that can be, in terms of the application of the fertilizer, targeting fertilizer applications for certain conditions that we could reduce it quite, quite easily if we understood that source pretty well. But yeah, it is agriculture that's the source. And, and I have a, just a couple points I'd like to make. Um, First, is I think you used the soil NOx inventory from Almarez, which was for 2016 or something, I think. Right. For the annual. Okay. So, A, it didn't have a diurnal emission rate, correct? It was just one average value for the day. So, your diurnal profiles are off, but I think it's still the average that's pushed up. We, we tested a diurnal profile. We just made one up. But it, again, that was just a sensitivity test. Right, right, right. So, so there's that. And also, the, in terms of the 2016, you know, that came from observations of soil moisture. The, the main parameters are soil moisture and temperature, which drive that source, and fertilizer application. Um, but the 2016, there, there's reason to believe that that source is increasing in time as agricultural productivity increases. So that the 2010 to 2015, you're comparing the same addition from the soil NOx, but there's every reason to believe that that has been changing in time and in increasing would be my guess. So that, that, that's gonna make that disparity early on in 2010 perhaps different. Right, so we're yeah. agreeing that. I think yeah. that there needs to be some thought about the interannual variability. I think agricultural yeah. methods are also changing over time. Yeah, so it's exactly. Not, not just productivity, but methods and Absolutely. irrigation methods. And, and there's a lot of things happening all at once here. And so there needs to be some thought about how to represent that correctly. Yeah, and, and so one other thing I'd like to point out is we just, you know, had, again, CARB-funded research, but a, a publication just accepted in Atmospheric Chemistry and Physics. Uh, Charles Delal is the lead author, but where we outline, we, we kind of go into the detail of our estimates for these NOx emissions, which we ascribe to soil NOx. Um, but we uh, outline past studies that have been done by satellite, which show exactly what your model shows, which is a diffuse cloud of NOx, or NO2 is what the satellite sees, in that region. And it's not pinpointed like in other regions, California is centered around urban centers. So there's, there's ample evidence in the past from satellite studies, for example, that show this, that is consistent with, I should say, this, this broader soil NOx source. Um, so, but, 
But I guess uh, just for everybody else, Ian and I are both at UC Davis, but we don't talk. So <laughs> we talk. We just don't ever show each other slides. So I, I, I wanted. I came to just see the data. <laughs> but I guess the point. The point I'm trying to make is that this really was an independent test. I mean, we we got that inventory from researchers at UC Davis, but we did not work with them. Uh, as this was this was an independent, neutral hypothesis test of just what does this tell us? Does it blow up something that indicates it clearly must be wrong? And and we didn't see evidence of that here. So we, we really are trying to be Switzerland in this. We, we didn't have a side in this. We were just testing it. Other than I was trying really hard to find something that explains the trends. I, I heard a printer. Uh, so do we have one that came in? Should I read it or? Okay. All right, so um, from Lori Gilbert. Hi, I'm wondering if anyone looked into the urea from Deary's and Capos in San Joaquin Valley. Could urea be a source that oxidizes into NOx? And so uh, I, I haven't. I'm not sure if anybody in the room has thought about that question. Okay, so I, I don't have any takers, but maybe somebody can follow up with Lori afterwards. Uh, then Evan Chip, uh, did you analyze the amount of horizontal transport from soil NOx rural areas to urban areas measuring high ammonium nitrate? I think some work should be done on the qualitative nature of transport between the rural and urban areas in low wind speed winter conditions. Well, in, in response to Evan's um, question, I can point to that last source apportionment plot that I showed really quickly, um, which includes transport. And so you can see then, um, um, you know, this is a full chemical transport model simulation that has uh, the, the transport part of it in there. And you can see that the, the soil NOx contributions are moving around. Uh, they, they don't have the highest contributions over the urban areas of Fresno and Bakersfield. But again, that will depend on where the wind's blowing uh, and, and which way things are sloshing around potentially. But at least during this Discovery AQ episode, uh, this is the picture that we think that tells a story of, of that transport part of the problem in addition to the chemistry. And, and then uh, from uh, Eric Prask, uh, does the UCD model include hydrolysis of organic nitrates? Uh, and so we, we don't have that in here. So we, we have N2O5 reacting on wet particle surfaces to form particulate nitrate, but we don't have an a organic one um, in here. I, I will say that um, Bill Carter and Havila Pai have uh, been adding to the SAPRAC chemical mechanism to try to add organic nitrate roots into this. And I didn't focus on that work in the interest of time. I'm already over time here. But uh, we did test that mechanism. And, and it wasn't dominant uh, in this system. That mechanism, I think, had been constructed to deal with biogenic emissions and biogenic chemistry in the southeast U US, where it does make more of a difference. But, but here, the, the chemical pathways that were introduced for that organic nitrate w weren't dominant. Uh, but that, that isn't to say that that's the end of the story. It's, it's just that's what we tested. So that's what I can answer. All right. So I'm looking at William then to uh, conclude us. If there aren't any <laughs> further questions, I'd, I'd like to close it and uh, thank uh, Professor Michael Kleeman again for his talk. Thanks.